John William Dunn was born in Ireland in 1875 and later served both as a trooper and an infantry officer in the Boer War. He took an interest in aeronautics as early as 1900 and went on to design and build the first British military aeroplane. He also began doing research into precognitive dreams, that is, dreams of future events and their relationship to the nature of time. He began by writing down his dreams in a notebook as soon as he woke up and checked events happening in his life over the following few days to see if any matched up with what he had written in the notebook. A pattern soon began to emerge in which many of his dreams consisted of a mixture of past and future events. To make sure that this was not something peculiar to just a few gifted people, he enlisted the help of many of his friends and colleagues, who all began making notes and checking their dreams. By this means he amassed a large amount of evidence in support of the existence of precognitive dreams. Next, of course, he had to work out a theory to explain this. One thing he noted from several precognitive dreams was that the dream was connected to the dreamer's mental state concerning the future event rather than the event itself. For example, a dream of an accident in which X number of people had been killed. Subsequent newspapers reported X deaths, but it was later found that the correct number was Y showing that the link was the reading and thinking of the accident rather than the actual accident. The theory he proposed, which he called serial time, was that there is a mentally imposed barrier that operates only on the waking mind and which prevents us seeing future events when we are awake but does not operate whilst we are sleeping and so we are able to dream of past and future events in equal amounts. He suggests that the ordinary time we experience, T1, as observed by ourselves as observer O1, this time we would call the, for the fourth dimension. Now this movement through time from the past towards the future must imply the existence of a further level of time which is used to measure the rate at which ordinary time T1 passes. This we call T2 which is the fifth dimension and is viewed by observer O2. Then of course we need another level of time to measure the flow of T2 and so on to infinity. We have a series of levels of time, T1, T2, T3 and so on, and a series of observers, O1, O2, O3 and so on. All these observers are of course ourselves, operating at different levels of the mind. This theory of time is what is called an infinite regress, and Dunn explained it thus. For motion of time must be timeable. If the moving element is everywhere along the time length at once, it is not moving. But the time which times that movement is another time, and the passage of that time must be timeable by a third time and so on. For an explanation of this series of observers, he uses an analogy of an artist. An artist sets up his easel and proceeds to paint the landscape before him. He then realises something is missing, himself. So he moves his easel back and paints himself in. But something is still missing, himself painting himself in. So he moves his easel back again, and so on. Dunn set out his theories in a series of books of which the best known is An Experiment with Time, published in 1927, which was followed by The Serial Universe, The New Immortality, Nothing Dies and Intrusions. There are problems with some aspects of Dunn's theory, and here I must quote J.B. Priestley, who was a friend of Dunn but did not agree with everything he wrote. When discussing this theory in Man and Time, he says the following. Now we come to the hard part. 
Let me put it briefly and brutally. The future can be seen, and because it can be seen, it can be changed. But if it can be seen and yet be changed, it is neither solidly there, laid out for us to experience moment after moment, nor is it non-existent, something we are helping to create moment after moment. If it does not exist, it cannot be seen. If it is solidly set and fixed, then it cannot be changed. What is this future that is sufficiently established to be observed and perhaps experienced, and yet can allow itself to be altered? And what is all this to do with the afterlife? Only this. Dunn says that we are all immortal beings. It is true that we die in time one when observer one reaches the end of his journey along the fourth dimension and then all possibility of intervention and action in time one comes to an end. This does not though involve the death of observer two who exists in time two. Observer two will experience time two all the time and not just when observer one was asleep people and things will be the same and yet not the same. We catch glimpses, though confused and distorted, of this after-death mode of existence in our dreams. Dunn points out that in our true dreams of unbroken sleep, to distinguish from fragmentary dreaming, we are never dazzled by bright suns, deafened by loud noises, irritated by uncomfortable clothing, scorched or frozen or fatigued. Dreams, although they seem real enough, lack all these unpleasant intensity characteristics of waking life. We are barely aware of the presence of our bodies. Dunn also suggests what will happen to our personal relationships. In the world of what we call our present life, a meeting is a state where two people are in close proximity and the communication between mind and mind, which is the essence of the meeting, follows through the ordinary medium of speech or signal. In the greater now, time two after death, your attention may visit a scene, and you may see again the one you seek. You may hear again the spoken words. You may receive and give the same caresses but the attention of that other may not be there. In that case, there is no meeting. Moreover, in the world of the greater now, communication is not by word or gesture, but through the medium of a common field of consciousness. Mind communicates direct with mind. Meeting in that world requires, if it is to last for more than a fleeting instant, mutual desire. But it requires something more than that if you are to savour it in full perfection. That is where ethics comes in. Bear in mind, please, to begin with, that the one you seek is engaged in his or her world building, and that the edifice aimed at is fairly certain to differ in many essentials from that which you would plan. Now, you can be a little god in your own little kingdom. You can make everything happen exactly as you please. You can meet again everyone you have ever known at any age you can remember. They will welcome you gladly if you wish it. They will acknowledge that you have been right after all in all those little quarrels. But presently, unless you are beyond measure foolish, you will realize that this docility does not ring true. It will be a terrible moment when you discover that the words are dictated by you, that the affection is of your own inventing. You will have what you have wanted all your life, a world wherein every wish is fulfilled. It is a little heaven of private pleasure and a hell of utter loneliness. To avoid or escape from that you must be willing to surrender some of your sovereignty. You must be prepared to build to please others. To again quote J.B. Priestley, 
simple and well-tried ethics, and no worse for that, but set against a background that seems to me an impressive, intuitive or imaginative effort on the part of an elderly aeronautical engineer. Nobody now can seriously examine the time problem without taking Dunn's work into account. It was never as widely recognised and appreciated as it should have been during his lifetime. He has still to be praised and honoured as one of our great originals and liberators. I should like to think that there was some way of conveying these thanks and a loud and affectionate bravo to his observer two or three.